17th century Europe, the scientific revolution was challenging ancient ideas and offering a new picture of the world. In the excitement over new knowledge, two views emerged about the source of knowledge. Rationalists claim that we can discover basic laws of the universe through pure reason. Empiricists maintained that all knowledge of the world must come through the senses. How can we acquire reliable knowledge? How do we come to know the basic laws of math and science? How do we know, for example, that every event has a cause, or that the angles inside every triangle add up to 180 degrees? 17th century rationalists believe that such knowledge comes from pure reason. We don't need to see examples in the physical world. We can grasp these truths entirely in our minds. To understand the rationalist position, imagine the perspective of the founder of that movement, the French philosopher René Descartes. He is the inventor of analytic geometry, and like two later thinkers who will also become known as rationalists, his special strength is mathematics. It was Descartes' ambition to develop a method of reasoning that could make knowledge in the physical sciences as indisputable as geometric proofs. The long chains of simple and easy reasonings by means of which geometers are accustomed to reach the conclusions of their most difficult demonstrations had led me to imagine that all things that humans are capable of knowing are mutually connected in the same way and that there is nothing so far removed from us as to be beyond our reach. I read Descartes as saying to himself, look, here we are at a time when people are discovering amazing new things. For 2,000 years, they've believed something completely different, which we now know to be wrong. But we're getting off on a new track with a new start. Discoveries are coming flooding in. How is this possible? How are we doing it? And his methodological reflections, his epistemology, his philosophy is generated out of that. You know, we've got some examples of firm knowledge here. Now, how do we keep going on this track? Descartes argued that the senses can perceive only the changing surfaces of things, but the mind can go deeper. Take, for example, this piece of wax. Its color, shape, size are apparent. It is hard, cold, easily handled, and sounds when struck with the finger. But while I am speaking, let it be placed near the fire. The color changes, its shape is destroyed, its size increases, it becomes liquid, it grows hot, it can hardly be handled, and although struck, it emits no sound. Does the same wax still remain after this change? It must be admitted that it does. What then was it I knew in the piece of wax? Assuredly, it could be nothing that I observed by the senses, since all the things that fell under taste, smell, sight, touch, and hearing are changed. And yet the same wax remains. I must therefore admit that it is the mind alone which perceives it. But what is the piece of wax that can be perceived only by the mind? It is certainly the same which I see, touch, Imagine, but, and this it is of moment to observe, the perception of it is neither an act of sight nor of touch, but is simply an intuition of the mind. For Descartes and later rationalists, only ideas derived from reason can give us knowledge that we can be certain is true. What interested them was the idea that there was a kind of knowledge that went directly from the faculty of reason to the truths involved. It bypassed experience entirely. And it was a kind of knowledge that gave you insight into necessary truths rather than contingent truths, truths that couldn't possibly be any other way. They were um, 
carved in hardest diamond, if you like, and they would never change. They wanted truths that were of a higher grade than we get from experience. Experiential truths are always contingent. They can always be refuted tomorrow, and maybe you made a mistake today. Uh, but in the realm of mathematics, in the realm of logic, there you could know truths not through any of the sense organs, but directly by reason. And what was the conflict with the empiricists who argued that all knowledge must come from the senses? The battle was fought over certainty, and whether reason was a faculty, a truth-finding faculty all on its own. The rationalists said yes. The empiricists said give us a break. If asked, what is real? The first thing most people think of is the physical world. The ground we stand on, the objects around us, our own bodies. A view called materialism holds that only the physical world is real. Materialism dates back to the 5th century BC when the Greek philosopher Democritus theorized that everything in the universe is made up of tiny atoms bouncing around and hooking together. Materialism rose to prominence with the scientific revolution. Inspired by the discoveries of Galileo and others, 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes sought to describe reality in a way that science could fully grasp. Reality, Hobbes argued, consists of matter, nothing else. The universe is body, and that which is not body is no part of the universe. And because the universe is all, that which is no part of it is nothing, and consequently, nowhere. In Hobbes' scheme of things, the human body is simply a machine. For what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels, giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer? But to say that reality consists only of matter seems to leave out other things. What about our conscious inner lives? What about deciding a move in a card game, or getting a joke, or feeling pleasure among friends? This inner stream of consciousness doesn't seem material. I think one's led to the conclusion that the fundamental ingredients of the world to generate consciousness have to, for example, to go beyond the fundamental ingredients of physics because nothing in the fundamental ingredient of physics is going to give you consciousness. So you need something else, some new fundamental ingredient in the world. Maybe you need something like consciousness as a fundamental ingredient in the world in the same way in which space and time and mass are fundamental ingredients. A view called idealism maintains not only that consciousness exists along with matter, it argues that reality is made up entirely of ideas. Writing somewhat later in the scientific revolution, Bishop George Barclay sought to crush the threat materialism posed to religion. If everything were made up of matter, where would God fit in? Where would souls fit in? What would happen to our souls after we die? Spiritual substances are for Barclay the ultimate building blocks of the universe. Uh, this obviously leaves Barclay with no problem of explaining uh, the immortality of the soul. Uh, the soul is a spiritual substance, it has no parts, and it's the sort of thing which uh, can survive. The crux of Barclay's argument is that we know about the world only through the ideas or sensations that our senses send to our minds. Since we can know only ideas, we can't conclude that a world of matter exists. It is indeed an opinion strangely prevailing among men that houses, mountains, rivers, and in a word, all sensible objects, have an existence distinct from their being perceived by the understanding. But this principle may involve a manifest contradiction. For what are objects but the things we perceive by sense? And what do we perceive besides our own ideas or sensations? In Descartes' 
Lord Zara, skepticism or casting doubt on everything was fashionable. In one famous meditation, Descartes posed every skeptical argument he could against the possibility of knowing anything for certain. Then he concluded that there was one thing he could know beyond any doubt. I noticed that whilst I thus wished to think all things false, it was absolutely essential that the I who thought this should be somewhat. And remarking that this truth, I think, therefore I am, was so certain and so assured that all the most extravagant suppositions brought forward by the skeptics were incapable of shaking it. I came to the conclusion that I could receive it without scruple as the first principle of the philosophy for which I was seeking. Many would contend that mental experience is not as certain as Descartes believed, but for others, his argument rings true. We have more confidence in the reality of our own conscious experiences than we have in the external world, than experiences in others, than in distant stars and galaxies, and so on. We know about this more suddenly than we know about anything else. This was, this was one of Descartes' points. I think this is one of Descartes' points, which has not been overturned. What looks like the very attractive uh, call of Descartes to us is set aside all appeal to authority, all appeal to what comes from outside, don't take it on somebody's word, check it out. Check it out yourself. How then would Descartes address the mind-body problem? Reflecting further on his thinking self, I saw that I could conceive that I had no body and that there was no world nor place where I might be, but yet that I could not for all that conceive that I was not. From that, I knew that I was a substance, the whole essence or nature of which is to think, and that for its existence there is no need of any place, nor does it depend on any material thing. Descartes saw this same distinction between mind and body reflected in all of nature. In 17th century philosophy, a substance was regarded as something that didn't depend on anything else for its existence. Descartes maintained that the entire universe consists of two substances, matter, which exists in space, and mind, which has no spatial or physical properties and exists only in God and human minds. The doctrine became known as Cartesian dualism. Cartesian dualism is a view that, as I see it, has very little chance of being true. It is a sort of an empty place waiting for someone to put a theory there. We'd like, for example, to be told just what is this mind stuff made of? What are its elements? What are its structural and dynamical properties? How does it behave over time? These are things that Descartes never gave us, nor any of Descartes' followers ever gave us. Perhaps the hardest question for Cartesian dualism to answer is this. If mind and body are separate and distinct substances, how can they interact? How can something outside the material world reach in and affect something in the material world without breaking basic laws of physics? There are some well-known physical laws, let's call them well-established physical laws, called the first law of thermodynamics, which says that energy is neither created nor destroyed, and uh, the law of conservation of momentum, which says that the total momentum in any closed physical system is always a constant. If we're going to have a law of uh, conservation of energy, but we're going to have uh, uh, the, the mental separate from the physical, is, isn't this law of uh, conservation of energy of the physical world going to be violated by having the mind poking around in there and moving things? Descartes recognized that. Descartes had a theory that if the mind somehow wigwagging a useless gland in the brain called the pineal gland, which actually, according to modern uh, paleontology, uh, is a residue of a prehistoric third eye in the top of the head. No uh, use for it was known in Descartes' day, much less its origin. The soul has its principal seat in this little gland which exists in the middle of the brain. The machine of the body is so formed 
that from the simple fact that this gland is diversely moved by the soul, or by such other cause, whatever it is, it thrusts the spirits which surround it towards the pores of the brain, which conduct them by the nerves into the muscles, by which means it causes them to move the limbs. So he thought, uh, lack of anything better, uh, that that would be his explanation of how mind works on body. But if there is even the slightest change in either the energy or the momentum of even the tiniest particle in your brain that isn't already explained by its energy exchange with some other purely physical particle, then what you've got is a flat violation of one or both of these two fundamental laws of nature. Few people have accepted Descartes' theory of the pineal gland, but his dualism did have an appeal for more basic reasons. Uh, even philosophers who don't agree with Descartes' dualism, and that would be the majority of philosophers today, uh, still wrestle with it because there is something rather right about the idea that in addition to my body, uh, I have uh, a mind which is not physical.